Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Fridays with Sandy. I'm John Byrne with Poets and Quants, and Sandy is in the house. Shalom, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy uh, post-Groundhog Day. And uh, we've got an exciting guest today, John. We'll introduce him, and then we'll talk to him himself here. We have a captain in the U.S. Army. His name is Riley. Uh, he has served in the Army for seven years. He was deployed to Afghanistan. He's currently working on the Surgeon General Staff. Uh, he has a 3.29 GPA and a 315 GRE, although he intends to take the GRE again. Uh, he's applying yeah, for folks, we figured out that a 315 GRE is kind of a 600 GMAT equivalent. So his target schools, Wharton. Georgetown, Columbia, and MIT. Ultimately, he wants to break into biotech or pharma uh, and use the MBA program to essentially transition from the military to a civilian life. So what do you think, Sandy? I, I think you're a great guy. Your resume is full of everything that business schools love, including various roles in the Army where you've been involved in. Uh, you, you're, you're typically a guy that they choose to show around dignitaries, that's a very revealing choice. Uh, your resume has alluded to the fact you often were selected for special positions out of you know 100 guys trying to get it. You've been involved with the um, different uh, military uh, functionalities. It's, it's all great. It's a terrific military resume. I've often said that B schools, the only th B schools are often baffled by military applicants. The only thing that B schools, most B school admissions officers understand about the military are pilots and combat. And it, it, it looks like you've had some, you know, it, you've been in some conflict zones. Is that right? Uh, yes, I spent a total of uh, two years in Afghanistan. Yeah. Okay. So that they'll they'll get that. Uh, uh, and 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 then the various points you make about yourself in in a quite appropriate way in your resume are very impressive. So you're a guy. In fact, I think his resume is spectacular. Don't you think? I, I agree. Thank you. Absolutely. It really makes you stand out big time. And uh, we should give a few little highlights to, to to explain this. You know, in each of the positions that he's had in the army. He notes how highly selective they are. So, for example, in his current position with the Surgeon General, he was selected above 70 peers. Uh, and then he goes on to explain exactly what he does. Uh, the clarity of the resume is fantastic. And to go to what Sandy said about yeah, oftentimes. This bullet scheduled and maintained diplomatic perfect. engagement with senior members of the Department of Defense in the White House. Business yeah. schools read that and they go, this is the kind of guy who really, when he joins an organization, they trust him. They use him as their ambassador. They use him as a liaison. That's just fantastic. And, and you, I don't want to embarrass you, but you've got a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff like that on your Thank resume. You know, I love this book. You planned and secured the relocation of over four and a half billion dollars worth of U.S. Aid property. I think this resume I think a school that doesn't accept you is crazy. Here's what here's what you don't have. You have a below average GRE score. You know, at 315, uh, you're below the Wharton 324, the Georgetown 317, the MIT 325. And although Columbia doesn't advertise its GRE, we can uh, anticipate that it's probably around 320. Um, so you're below all of those. And on the GPA, you're also below uh, the average on those schools. I think your resume and your work experience more than make up for it. But, you know, uh, so I'm going to quote Sandy here. Admission officers will blink once, but they don't want to blink twice. And you don't want them to blink twice on both your GPA and your standardized test score. Although, you know, you do have an undergraduate degree in biology. So that's helpful because that's a rigorous subject. You do not have it from an elite university and, Sadly. Well, hey, 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 Riley, what is Marywood University? Yeah, in Marywood Scranton. University. It is. It's in Scranton. It's a small uh, Jesuit school uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's very small. Um, 
and has a has a fantastic STEM program, a great pre med pre PA program, very intense, um, but it's not particularly well known. And uh, I was a uh, I grew up in Delaware. We had a, a really small town with uh, not a ton of outreach. And uh, Mary would offer me scholarship. They gave me an opportunity, and I'm proud of the education I got there. But I do know that it's not the name brand. School yeah, that... there's no reason to. Be, it's fine. Uh, the, the business schools allow people to start from any place. It's just like like John said, quoting me, "You can start any place. They'll blink once, but they won't blink twice." Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, unfortunate. Look, Wharton and MIT, they're elitist institutions. I just put it out there. Yeah, hey John, and... you're good at this. Go go through them. Go through each it, one. Go through Warden, Georgetown, Columbia, and MIT. And yeah, uh, I mean, look, me Warden, Warden and MIT are, are really elitist, and and where you go to get your undergraduate degree tends to matter to them based on the data that I've seen. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's going to hold you back, but it's not going to help you. Let me put it that way. And then when you combine that with the with the below average GPA and the GRE you're asking them to blink more than once. So this is why I think it's helpful for you to take the GRE again. I do think Georgetown is going to bite and take you. Look, you're a fantastic candidate. Wharton, Columbia, and MIT should take you. Uh, but they're so hung up oftentimes on, on elitist credentials that, I don't know. That hey, hey could, Riley, uh, do you know the military cohort at those schools in terms of numbers? I do not, uh, not at Georgetown or Wharton uh, or, or the others to, to, for that matter. I know that uh, Wharton being the largest, I think there are about 40 or so veterans per class, I believe. Yeah. In some ways, uh, that's your competition. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Although it's and not here's... strictly so. I mean, a school. Yeah, but here's something, Sandy, that you know. You know, the elite schools like West Point grads, oh, for you know, sure. Naval Academy grads, and they're hung up on that a lot of times. And it's unfair. On the other hand, I think Riley has completely distinguished himself with his service in ways that probably most West Point grads do not, incidentally. Uh, okay, uh, I, I agree with that. And uh, very, schools try and have one person on the admissions committee with military background or, or they claim they try. I, I don't know how valid that is, but they, if, if they do, they often give them the military cohort. So that guy or that gal becomes the de facto admissions office for military people. Uh, isn't that your sense of it, John? Yeah. And there's so many military candidates in the, in the, uh, applicant pool is that admissions gets it and this this is a standout resume i mean i've rarely seen a resume as good as this and presenting uh one it's both a, it's both standout in content and 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 the way you say it yeah it's uh it's great we just got to deal with the boo-boos that's what we're here for <laughs> did you already submit your applications to wharton columbia and mit I've, I've, so I've submitted to Georgetown and Warden. I'm working on uh, Columbia and MIT now. Okay. Yeah, but they'll take they'll take standardized test scores after you submit the application, won't they, John? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So you're not, you getting off the, you're not getting off the hook, Riley. Take the, take the GRE again and, <laughs> yeah. and send it to them. Look, just because it's, it's a practice kind of thing, you get a higher score a second time you take it or almost everybody. This. Not only send it to them, Send them the un as soon as you get out of the test and get the unofficial score. Send them that; they'll believe it, you know, and say, you know, official score to follow. But the other the other thing, Riley, is I, I mean, there are three schools I would really want you to apply to, and I would apply. I would have applied to those schools instead of Wharton and MIT. Three schools are UVA Darden, which really loves vets. And it's not going to be bothered by the fact that you went to Mary Wood. And because they're test optional, they're going to, they're going to see what your major is and, and the fact that you're a STEM guy. And they're going to look at this resume and they're going to love it. I would apply to Duke and I'd apply to Michigan. Michigan also is doing waivers on tests as Darden is. So they're not as hung up about uh, standardized test scores. Uh, could, uh, John, could you explain to our uh, legion of viewers what what a, what what doing waivers on tests are? Yeah, you you basically apply and say, "Hey, uh, 
uh, I'd like a waiver because, you know, I have a STEM background, having worked uh, actually in the Surgeon General's office, as well as earned an undergraduate degree in STEM from a from a university that's known for uh, STEM programs and don't feel the need to submit a test. And, and some schools will say, yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, Darden and Michigan are two of the more liberal schools regarding uh, waivers. Boy, this and, is kind and, of newish. Could, do you have any idea of yeah. any percents or numbers about how many people do that or how hard it is to get a waiver? Yeah, I think I, I think in the last uh, class at Darden, as many as 20 to 25 percent of the students didn't take a standardized test and got in. Like 20, 25 percent are enrolled in the latest cohort at Darden without a standardized test. OK, let's yeah. just make a super macro point for our viewers. Uh, John, here's here's a question for you. Total number of business school applications are going up or down? Uh, down, and uh, particularly domestic applicants. So that gives you another advantage. Yeah. So things have gotten easier than they were. The high tide of how hard it is to get into business school has passed. It, it's things are a little yes. easier now, just based on the number. I mean, the applicant pools are still deep with talent. And what, as we mentioned before, Riley, you're going to be competing with uh, veterans who went to service academies. That's one issue. But like I said, again and again, it's a broken record. But man, you have incredible experience and you've really stood out. OK, Riley, uh, let me ask you some of the questions I always ask people. Name someone who's a role model for you whose job you would want in, uh, you know, at the height of your career in like, you know, 30 years or whatever. 30 years. Um, I asked this question every week. So far, nobody's answered it. OK, <laughs> I believe that's correct. Nobody has been able to answer it. It's the critical question. And doing the research on that question would be very valuable. OK, sure. right. Uh, I don't care what your answer is. You okay. should you should what you should do is just, you know, Google leaders in uh, biotech, see what comes up. Hey, uh, just go right to something called the top 25 biotech CEOs of 2022. It's on the healthcare technology report. There are little bios on each of these folks. That's gold, man. CEO That's gold. Smith Klein, the smaller uh, biotech startups. And I guarantee you that several of these people will have had military backgrounds as well. So you actually might be inspired by their stories. That's, that's super helpful. And I certainly will. I could definitely name positions. I don't think I could name people, but I, that's, that's where I could work on that. Yeah. People, you True. should be able to talk about three people who are role models. It's not an unfair question. Definitely. Particularly in a, in a case like yours where they might say, hey, where's, where's this biotech coming from? You're, you're uh, you know, wh wh how did you get interested in that? You're, it doesn't, it, there's not much footprints of that on your resume so yeah working, working in my current position uh overseeing a lot of what's coming up through medicine through federal channels and what's coming down through the dod and, and being dispersed i'm privileged to see a lot of that sort of that sort of thing and um and understand what advances are we are adopting and pushing out um getting to see those policies those those um propositions come through is incredible and, and getting okay, any just let me interrupt for a uh Cosmetic tip here. You got to look in the camera, man. You you might be interviewed on Zoom, and uh, looking in the camera is real important. All right, thank you. So I, for me, it's it's about the ability to be on the other side of the fence when it comes to biotech. I get to see a lot of what happens after the innovation has occurred and it's been pushed through whatever regulatory process we have, the FDA, whatever agency it may be, and I enjoy that. But I'd like to be on the side of the fence and be the person that's part of that team pushing that product to the integration point, that bisection or intersection rather between federal and corporate infrastructures. If I played Why that back and uh, and uh, offered people a million dollars to explain what you said, nobody would win a million dollars. But I, I wonder why you. Made no, this is biology. important. I want to. I want to stress. I want to stress the uh, delivery here because it's it's important. You, you, you've got to do a better job of uh, both preparing. If, if you get interviewed, an answer like that is something that they don't, that they take note of. They go, boy, 
this is the kind of guy, if he gets called on in a case method classroom, other people start checking their email. Mm. So that's real important. That, that's the, it's one of the purposes of an interview. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know if you have, you know, if these are just hard questions or whatever, but you really got to work on that. All right. So, so ultimately your advice, Sandy, is retake the standardized test. Let the schools that you're applying to know you're do, doing that so they know um, that you know. You don't have to know. No, just you don't have to let them know. This, this is just a technical trick. When you, when you retake the test, set it, if the results are you know, really impressive, if the results are better, Send them, you'd write them a note saying, I just took the GRE again, and these were my scores. And you mm -hmm. can give, there's usually some document with your unofficial score. Yes. You know, and, and, and you know, the, the real score will follow. I just wanted to let you know. They'll believe you. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. And you just do that immediately. That way. And we should let you know, we hate telling you this because it's ridiculous you know, that a few points on a dumb test is going to make a difference, but it could make a difference at, at you know, Wharton, Columbia, and MIT. Yeah, I need the feedback. And, you know, it just, it just does. And, and we're, I hate that it does. Let me put also, it. Yeah, way. yeah. But all, yeah, a, a couple of questions can often have a dramatic outcome in the score. Yeah, that's exactly, especially and, on the GRE. The, the, the fact is most people do better the second time. There's no and doubt the about that. All the research shows that. Yeah. The other the other thing is, uh, I, I I do think if, if you have the time and the inclination that Darden, Duke, and Michigan would be great schools for you. You you could, I hate to tell you to try to do round three. There could be a little enough time for you for round two. Those schools have a uh, little later deadlines than Wharton and Columbia, I believe. Do uh, you think, what are his odds at Georgetown? With these numbers? Uh, yeah. Same numbers. Boy, uh, 30, 40%. Depends on, a lot depends on the military cohort. If you're, if you watch these tapes, I barely say more than 30, 40%. You're, you're not a lock just because you're asking them to blink. Mm -hmm. So it, it just in terms of making odds, you know, that goes into it. Sure. And, uh, you know, Wharton, don't you think, Wharton would be the hardest, John, don't you think? Yeah. They're, they're, well, um, both Wharton and MIT, because you know how hung up yeah. they are on standardized Yeah, both tests. Wharton and MIT are hung up on numbers. At least Wharton is big. MIT, I, I think what MIT, MIT is going to find a soldier like you that they, they with better numbers. Sure. If you know what I'm saying. I do, yeah. Uh, well, there you go. And then uh, I, I think you're going to get into Georgetown. I think Columbia is possible. Uh, I think if you get a number of a few more points, okay, on just your say GR, again the schools you should you should think he should also look at. You were very good at UVA, that. Garden, Duke, Fuqua, and Michigan Ross. All those three schools, much better probability of you of them accepting you, uh, even with. Uh, the blinks that we mentioned, and uh, and those are three fantastic, great schools that will allow you to do whatever you want to do with the MBA. Mm -hmm. um, they have great networks. They have great military cohorts. I hope you succeed, and I hope you are responsible for many innovations that uh, make my senior years <laughs> longer <laughs> and healthier. Ah, uh, uh, that's funny. Now, okay, uh, Riley. Uh, look, you, you got a fantastic background. You should feel, really feel good and proud. Uh, you, you've already had an incredibly successful uh, life and career. And um, there's no doubt that you're going to get into a world-class MBA program. Uh, and you're going to do exceptionally well. So we wish you good luck. And for all of you out there, good luck on your MBA journey. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. You've been watching Fridays with Sandy. <laughs>